Hey guys, Kevin is my first Scream Queen Season 1, Episode 4, Haunted House, and I was actually really looking forward to this episode. I mean, last week's episode made me a lot more hopeful for this show. It seemed like they were starting to establish a really well-realized tone of just being really silly and not taking things too seriously. But then we get to this episode, and this episode was very bizarre. I mean... It was funny. I will admit that. There were some things that were very, very funny about this episode. Probably some of the funniest stuff Scream Queens has done so far. But then throughout the entire episode, there were these small, every single point in this episode, like a little message to it. And it felt so weird and so off-putting, especially from a show that we're not supposed to take seriously at all. I don't know why they did this. There are so many serious moments this episode. There are so many moments where we're supposed to take the show seriously. And starting off right with the first scene, which right off the bat felt like it was from a different show. I was like, what the fuck is this? Like, it was so strange, the first scene. Because basically we see this, um, this article talking about how great of a year 2015 was for Chanel, and how she plans on taking over Halloween and calling it Chanel-oween. And they are apparently filming something about it, and she talks about how much Halloween means something to her, and... Her, how in her own way she wants to do something for her supposed fans, because apparently Chanel has all these fans. Why the fuck she has fans, I have no idea. Um, but she buys them all presents for her fans, and we see that she does have a lot of fans who, for whatever reason, adore her. And I do think it was kind of funny that she was sending them all these terrible presents and they still kind of loved her. Kind of showing how shallow some people can be. But it was just so weird, especially for Chanel. I mean, this was something that Chanel would probably never do. I don't know why we saw this, and it just felt so so out of character. I get that she wants to make herself look good for the media, but why is Chanel all of a sudden this celebrity? Why? We've never heard of this before. We've never heard that Chanel Oberlin is a celebrity. We've never heard any of this, and it just felt very out of context. I mean, did she turn into, like, Madison for American Horror Story Coven all of a sudden, where she's, like, this famous movie star? I mean, obviously, she's not. She's Chanel. Chanel, I thought, was just a girl that's in a sorority house who thinks she's popular, and she, you know, is the most popular girl there. And she, of course, is the president. I didn't think that she was actually, you know, very respected by all these girls. And we're not just talking college girls here. They're, like, little girls. They're, like, preteen girls. I mean, it just felt like a very bizarre way to start the episode. The girls simply don't care that these messages are mean spirit which I do think is funny, but it wasn't meant to be, it was meant to be taken seriously. Like, we're supposed to take what's going on here seriously. We're supposed to see that Chanel truly does have a heart and that she does care uh, for these girls. Problem is, Chanel is probably at her worst in this entire episode, because after this sequence, we see Chanel back to how she was in episode one, which, as you guys know, really pissed me off, and I was actually really starting to like Chanel. I think she's not a good character, but I was kind of starting to like her. I think she's actually was pretty funny last week, but now they're back to the whole mean-spirited stuff, and th when this show just flat-out insults people, it's not funny, it's just insulting, and I've said it before, insults aren't just funny because they're insults. They're funny because there's build-up to it and the way that you say it and the context and the show does not seem to understand that that was something I definitely had a problem with so basically after the attack police are looking all over the sorority house for any kind of evidence that they could find and this felt more like a proper start to the episode because as we know last week you know basically um Gigi and Wes pretty much think that Munch is uh, the Red Devil, and Chislam is questioning her, and asks her if she has plans, and basically all he does is ask her if she has plans of coming to the precinct pig roast, and she says she wouldn't miss it for the world, and Wes says that there's no way that Munch could be, you know, the killer, and since she, you know, basically... Um, Chislam says that there's no way that Munch could be the killer since she has been the dean for over three decades, and Gigi says that she's obviously the killer, and Munch gives them a rundown of what they're accusing her of, and I thought it was pretty funny to see that. Munch is barely in this episode, though, which was kind of disappointing because I'm actually really liking what they're starting to do with Munch, especially in this episode. She had some of the funniest stuff, and I definitely really like what they did with her, so I was kind of upset that they didn't give her a lot of screen time because, again, like I said, Jamie Lee Curtis is something that a lot of people are watching this show for. For, and they're really not utilizing her character as well as they should be. I've said it, you know, for the past, for the first two episodes, and again here, it seemed like last week they were starting to use her very well, but here again, it just feels like they're not utilizing her character to the best they could be. 
So she says she won't blame Wes for this because of how overwhelmed he is for Grace. And again, she tries to make a pass him. It's very strange. She says she wants him to be her date for the faculty Halloween party. And they're going as Bo Peep and her sheep. And then Denise comes in to ruin this scene. I thought it was hilarious. Denise, throughout this whole episode, is still great. And I think that's something that is going to be great all season. And when Denise gets killed off, I'm going to be really pissed off because she's one of the best characters on the show by far. She runs in, tells him about the attempted murder from the killer, and it all connects to Zay Day. She still thinks that Zay Day is the killer, and she tells Shonda Shondell she will avenge her death, and she's literally, like, praying to Shondell. She's like, the best buy in heaven where you are. I thought that was definitely very funny. And basically, she promises her she's gonna avenge her death and solve the mystery. So, Pete and Grace then drive to the house of the girl that dropped out of college, two credits shy of graduating, and that girl, of course, was this girl, Mandy, who we knew they were gonna see her. Now, at this point, I was actually really liking the episode. I thought these two scenes were very good, and I definitely really liked it, and they this scene goes on for a very long time, definitely, and they knock on her trailer and pretend to be early trick-or-treaters, and they claim to be dressed as Matthew McConaughey and Kate Hudson from How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, and I have to say, this was by far Pete's best episode yet. He's felt very out of place in the show, and it really seems like he's starting to click here because he was hilarious in this episode. The way he kept impersonating Matthew McConaughey as he was this reporter and as he was reporting stuff he pretended to be Matthew McConaughey was just hilarious and it was one of the funniest parts of the episode by far and if they can continue to do stuff like that with Pete then I'm really gonna like him as a character. Um, basically she can tell they want to talk right away about Kappa Kappa Tau because she says she's been waiting 20 years for someone to ask about it. And she says she's been living off the grid since that night. She serves them dinner. And Grace and they had like this really weird meat. It's like, I guess she shot it and she said it's raw and everything. And Grace talks about how they are reporting from the paper they work for. But Pete promises they'll keep her name out of it. And he keeps acting like Matthew McConaughey here. And I thought it was just very funny. She says her life is bait. And by the way, pretty solid impression, honestly. Pete's impression was pretty solid, honestly. It, it sounded like Matthew McConaughey. I don't know if he's working. I don't know if Diego Bonetta has worked with Matthew McConaughey. But honestly, I believe it because that was a pretty spot-on interpretation. So she says her life is basically split in two before that before that night and after. And she says the story of the bathtub is real. She was there. And we get this really elaborate flashback that I really liked. I definitely really like the flashback here um, from what happened. And I like finding out what happened in 1996, obviously. It's something that's very important and something that we need to see. So after the girls murder Munch, basically Munch, basically we realize that after the girls um, murder in the bathtub, Munch basically said that if police get involved, the girls could get into um, neglect, neglect, neg I think it's called negligent homicide, and if the police come, they will arrest all of them for leaving the girl to die while they were downstairs, uh, as she said, I, I, as she said, um, uh, getting into the groove, which I thought was pretty funny, and I liked it. She was like, you were downstairs, getting into the groove, and I thought that was definitely very funny. Just how deadpan she was was great, and Miss Bean, who we see again, of course, and she's still a very strange character. Um, I, I get that they want to use her for the flashbacks, but still, she's very weird. She says that they need to dispose of her immediately, and she thinks of possible cannibalism and actually feeding the girls as food. And Munch goes to shut down the party. One girl decided to stay and watch the baby. And Munch, basically Mandy says she made them wear hoods so they wouldn't see where the body was. And Munch tells them they must leave school immediately. And she tells them to avoid any contact with, any, with each other ever again. They ask what if her parents come looking for her and the baby's father. And Munch says to leave all the details to her. She's the administration's liaison. It's a sorority pledge dies. Her career is over. She's simply protecting them and their family. Families. They might die, they might think she's a monster, but years from now they will remember her as their guardian angel. And she was pretty creepy in this scene, I have to say. This is probably Munch at her creepiest. I've never seen Munch be as creepy as she was in this scene, but this was definitely very creepy. Mandy says she left the next day, told her parents it was from the stress, other girls changed their names, moved away, one killed herself, another was institutionalized, and the other apparently is on Fox News. Um, that was kind of strange. And she says Munch is the devil, but they can't tell her she told him this, and she says the baby was a girl, Grace says it was a boy, and it's Chad, and... Basically, she says she knows the difference between a boy and a girl, and that baby was a girl. So Grace is starting to think that this baby could be her, which honestly does make sense. Obviously, her mom died in Kappa House. She doesn't know too much about her. So Grace could very well be this baby, and I thought that was definitely very interesting. So we then get this scene with Earl and Zayde, who apparently are a thing are a thing now. It seemed like they were dating in this episode. Out of nowhere, it kind of seemed that way. Um... Earl gives Zayde a, la a latte and tells her how he heard she wanted to run for Kappa president, and she has his full support, 
And she says unless he's in Kappa House, his support doesn't matter. And she asks why he cares anyway. And Earl says when people hear the word fraternity, they don't think of it in a positive way. The Greek system will be obsolete in generation if things don't change. And this, I thought, was an important issue that they had here. You know, the Greek system talking about how important it is and how he wants a change. He doesn't want fraternities to look bad because, yeah, fraternities don't have the best reputation. And he says that um, he believes they can make that change. And she asks if he plans on running for president of the... Dollar Scholars, and he says he already tried, and Chad is unbeatable. She asks if he can really beat, if she can really beat Chanel. He says she can with her campaign. Basically, she will, so people know that she's not just doing it to be popular. So throw a party as a fundraiser for a cause that's close to her heart, and she thinks of sickle cell anemia. So everyone's carving pumpkins, and Zadie asks Grace what's wrong. She says she just found out something she can't stop thinking about. Obviously, it's about her possibly being uh, the dead baby, you know, the baby, and basically... Chanel comes down, and basically she asks if they're okay with doing this in the same room that Miss Bean died in, and Chanel says Miss Bean is not dead. She's pretty sure she's the one haunting the campus, which I think is very strange. She says they need to get this done fast for her Instagram followers. All of their designs are very weird, except for, you know, some of them have, like, uh, Chanel number three is Charles Manson. Um, another person had, you know, weird writing, and basically Chan Grace is, is just a regular Jack Lantern. Obviously, Chanel's not okay with that. And then Zayde says, yes, I can, and she tells Chanel she plans to run for president. Obviously, Chanel's very pissed off about this, and Jennifer asks why she's holding a fundraiser. Zadie sh says she wants to show she's a serious candidate, and she doesn't just want to be, she doesn't just want it to be a popularity contest, and Chanel cuts her off, says she doesn't think she understands what she just did. She will not be winning an election anytime soon, and when she loses, she will make sure she will ruin her reputation. Zadie tells her that she's a stuck-up sociopath, and everyone in the room knows it, and everyone in the room witnessed her actually murder someone. She says she didn't murder Miss Bean, and if she she does murder someone, it's going to be her. So then we see that Chanel's, the Chanel's then find Chanel, she's sharpening a knife out of nowhere. I mean, it's just, it's a very strange scene. And basically, they tell her that the, she has their full support and that they want to help her and everything. And basically, they tell her to put the knives down. She says she doesn't know what came over her. Chanel number five says Zayde's throwing a party, so they will have to throw another one. Chanel comes up with the idea of a haunted pumpkin patch. They decide to raise it for what uh, Chanel number three uh, says is the worst um, possible disease ever, Black Hairy Ton, which I don't know if that's a thing, but that was kind of funny, I guess. Um... And then season, and then the next, basically, the next scene, Mandy randomly gets murdered. She's watching Leprechaun, and she hears someone knocking out of their trailer. I will admit the scene was actually pretty creepy, definitely, especially for our show. It's not supposed to be creepy. The scene actually was kind of creepy. I did like that she was making fun of Leprechaun. I was like, oh, just just get your pot of glory. I thought that was pretty funny, uh, which I will be reviewing Leprechaun um, for 31 Days of Horror, just for shits and giggles, and you guys will probably look forward to that. Um, but basically... She opens the door, no one is there, she hears more knocks, but she doesn't know where it's coming from. She's then killed by the Red Devil, and right away it's like, okay, she's killed. Um, so that happens, and then we get what is by far my favorite plot point of this episode, and had to do with Chad and Hester. And, oh my god, I could have never thought of these two working together and actually having a relationship that they do in this episode, but it was pretty damn funny, I have to say. I definitely really liked it, and Chad and Hester... Really something that's saving this show, definitely. They are very funny in this episode. Chad's in the cemetery, imagines how sexy all the dead girls must have been, and he starts to jerk off in a graveyard. Literally, he's starting to jerk off in a graveyard, and Hester asks if that's his grandmother. He says sometimes he comes out, and when he finds out, he likes, he, he, um, he finds when he likes, he gets turned on and jerks off to it, and Hester says she gets it. She gets it more than anyone. She finds that by is extremely arousing, but she doesn't know why they have all these dark feelings, and Chad thinks their generation has had it too easy, and they they haven't seen enough violent stuff. And this was very strange. Again, it seemed like they're trying to put this message into the episode here. And I get that they're trying to maybe, like, further Chad's character, but he's not supposed to be a likable character. He's simply supposed to be just a very dickish um, guy and a very shallow guy who just cares about sex. That's all he cares about. And that's something I think they're doing a very good job with. But don't throw in this random scene of us trying to see his character, because I think it definitely is very strange. So she talks about how Chanel, it basically she talks about how the only reason that he loves Chanel is because he just fantasized about having sex with her lifeless corpse, and she says she wants everything Chanel has, and that includes him, and she says Chanel is done in today's date, and by the way, Leah Michelle in the scene was great. I mean, we've never seen Leah Michelle play such a demented character, and she was so great in the scene. She says Chanel is done, Zayde will win for president, and when she does, she will win vice president, who she plans on killing, and wants to take the position from her, and she tells him that she puts out, he says he needs to do it with 
with her now. She says it's not scary enough, but to keep... Literally, a graveyard tour is not scary enough. She says to keep his phone on. Maybe he'll get a phone call from her about finding some place scary to me, and maybe she'll even let him do anal, um, which I thought was pretty funny. So then we see Wes is again showing this class, Children of the Corn, this time. He's showing them Children of the Corn, which is very strange. And he talks about how there couldn't be anything scarier for an adult than a child coming to murder them. And I will admit, he does bring up some compelling arguments here. But again, I'm really not liking Wes as a character because it just feels very weird what they're doing with him. You know, on one hand, he's this protective father that's trying to protect Grace. And then on this other hand, you have him being this really weird uh, film studies professor. It's just very strange. Um, Grace comes up to him. And then we get this emotional scene just out of nowhere. The scene is extremely emotional. And Grace is asking Wes, you know, if she is the baby and, you know, why he hasn't told her. And that all they really talked about her mom is that she was at Kappa and she died when she was two and not much else. And she says, pretty convenient how she supposedly died in a fire with all their stuff burned, no records of her, her birth certificates. And he claims that it has nothing to do with this. And she obviously doesn't believe him. So basically... That's what happens there. But again, it just felt like a very out-of-context scene. It was a very strange scene, and I definitely thought that was a very uh, bizarre scene that we got there. So, and it wouldn't have been as bizarre if they would have taken it as seriously as they do. I did find it um, kind of funny that Wes couldn't figure out what she was talking about. But again, it kind of seemed like you're just trying to make us suspicious of Wes, which is stupid. I know that Wes is not the killer. There's no way he is a killer. I think he, there, out of anyone, he definitely is not the killer. And I know for a fact that if anyone's a killer, it's certainly not um, Wes. I know that for a fact. And I know that that could be stupid that I'm thinking that, but I'm just thinking there's just no way. There's nothing that makes me think it. There's nothing that, and I get that that could be unpredictable, but I don't feel like this show goes for unpredictability. I feel like they go for predictability, and they that's kind of what the show wants to be. It doesn't want to be predict an unpredictable show at all. So... Basically, that's what happens there. Pete and Grace then both get a text um, to meet at a specific place. They go there, and Pete says they are there to find the baby. But then Zayday and Earl jump out because they want to make it a spot for the Halloween party. And Denise tells them this is a horrible idea. She will not because the house is definitely haunted. And they talk about this legend about this woman who wailed about her dead children and that this is the house she lived in. And from the story, they they see the dolls that look just like the women's children, and it all took place in 1995, the same year as the bathtub baby. And Zadie thinks that this is perfect. Denise asks what she plans on, and basically, Denise is still on her. She thinks that she plans on killing people at this haunted house, and... Zayde actually starts to get onto Denise a little bit, which I really like seeing here. Um, one of the funniest plot points, definitely. I really like this interaction between uh, Zayde and Denise. We realize, though, that again, we try to put some message here that they forced down our throats, and it was stupid, and I definitely did not like it. We realize that Denise used to go to Wallace University and also pledge Kappa, but she did not fit in there well. They didn't accept black people. And I'm just thinking, this is the 90s. Since when were black people not accepted in the 90s? I mean, wasn't that the time when they were trying to get more black actors out there? I mean, it just feels very strange that uh, we have this bizarre storyline like this, definitely. Um... And uh, Zayde says she was rejected, she dropped out of school, and Denise says she enrolled in community college, and Zayde says she's on to her because she sees everything she could have been, but she's going to take it a step forward by becoming the first black president of Kappa, and Denise tells her she has her eye on her and doesn't trust her one bit. And then we get what is by far the weirdest scene to come out of this entire show, okay? This, scene, this show has been weird. It really has. But there has not been a scene weirder than this scene. I don't know what they were trying to do here, but this scene failed horribly. I'm sorry. It really did. Um, and this was just very strange because Chanel, it starts with Chanel basically telling everyone that if they don't want to get murdered by the Red Devil, they are to come to her party over Zaydays. And I thought that was kind of funny the way she did that. But the Chanel's are doubtful. She says she's glad they have her back. Shit. Sorry, guys, I just turned this on on my phone. I'm sorry about that. I didn't even realize I did that. Um, but basically, tells everyone they don't want to get murdered by the Red Devil. They're to come to her party over Zay Days, but the Chanel's are doubtful. They don't think this is going to work out very well. She says she's glad to have their back, and they then eat con balls for lunch, which Hester, which we know they're doing because we found in the last episode, but Hester thinks this is a terrible idea, and the fact they spent time on this, I thought was really pointless. I don't know what they were trying to do here. Again, it just felt like they're trying to throw a message down our throats, and then these two guys start flirting with them. Now, you think their reaction would be to flirt with these guys back, but that's not their reaction. They're actually not turned on by these guys. Why? 
I don't know. These girls are sluts. We've established this. These girls have slept with every, you know, this. these girls have slept with Chad. They've slept with a bunch of guys. They've had sex with a lot of guys. Um, why aren't they attracted by these guys? What did these guys have the other guys didn't? It just, it felt very strange that they tried to do this. I get that they're trying to do, like, a sexual harassment story, but this was very bizarre, definitely. I mean, if Chad would have asked them, they probably would have done it. Um, it just felt very weird. They're surprisingly not impressed. Hester kicks in this guy up. They beat up the guys, pull garbage all over them, then get a standing ovation from everyone in the cafeteria, and it just was a very bizarre scene overall. I definitely not like that, and I really hope the show never does something like that again, because that really left me with just being like, what the fuck was that? That was very strange. I don't know what they really were trying to do there, and it felt very weird to me. But then we get an awesome scene with Hester and Chad. Hester basically has found a meeting place for her and Chad to meet up. She accuses him of being the one to text her, which I thought was pretty funny. Um, basically, they go into Zayday's haunted house. He asks her name and clearly doesn't like her name, which I thought was funny. He's like, Hester, that's 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 a great name. I thought that was funny. He looks for her. She finds a what she thinks is a wax replica of Miss Bean with her face fried off. However, they realize it's actually her real dead body. And they then see, and this... The thing I hate about this scene is that they should know that Chanel number two, they're not supposed to know Chanel number two is dead. Why doesn't they have, why don't they have a reaction when they see Chanel number two being dead? You know, why isn't Chester like, oh, Chanel number two died. They don't know she died. The only person they, that know that she's dead are the Chanel's. So why doesn't Hester have a reaction here? That's very strange. They see Coney, everyone else has died. They're all trapped in this haunted house. They go to a diner and we see Hester legitimately terrified here. And she says she's never been so scared in her whole life. She says they have to warn people about the haunted house, but it only attracts more people. I thought that was kind of funny. This really great joke about how, you know, how however many people are in the haunted house, it just kept attracting more and more people. And of course, they think that they're not real, um, but Zayday tries to get them all to leave. No one listens. Grace and her go to, the go to look at the dead bodies. And when Zayday calls the police, she attracts them to go to, and even attracts the police to go, which I thought was pretty funny. And I like that it was called Shady Lane. That was definitely very funny. I mean, what do you think it's called Shady Lane? What do you think it's going to be? They again think she's playing around, and then she sees the Red Devil, and she's not killed. She's actually kidnapped by the Red Devil. Why? I don't know. Why the Red Devil kidnapped her it makes no sense What? Whatsoever. It only seemed like they did this to spare her as a character, and I don't know why the Red Devil didn't just kill her. There had to be a reason why. Obviously, the Red Devil doesn't seem like he would just kidnap someone. It seems like he would kill her, and I don't know why he didn't. It just, if they would kill off Zayday, yeah, I'd probably be pissed off, but why didn't he kill her? It doesn't really make a lot of sense for him not to kill her. I don't really know what the thought process in that was. It was very strange, definitely, that he didn't, uh, that he spared her like that. So Grace says they have to file a missing persons report as someone has kidnapped Zayde, and Chanel says she hopes she's back in time for the election. Wes says that Munch has to shut down the campus immediately because of the five dead bodies in the house, and Chisholm says they're not related in any way to the deaths because it's an off-campus house. She goes down the list of everyone. Chanel fakes it for Miss Bean, which I thought was um, actually pretty pathetic. It was supposed to be funny, but I thought it was really stupid overall because it's, it's obvious that Chanel killed Miss Bean even though she doesn't want to admit, and it just, it's really, really overacting. Um, then we, of course, you know, Shondell, Mandy, who are not students, and then Grace then brings up Coney, who was a student, and Pete points out how he was decapitated. Gigi says it sounds a little bit more than con um, coincidental, who we haven't seen Gigi, like, at all in this episode. It's very strange that we didn't see Gigi a lot. Um, and Wes says he will be forced to the medium. If she can't see, that action must be taken. Wes tells Grace she will not be leaving the house tonight. Pete says he will keep a close eye on her. The Chanel's go upstairs, and Grace says they need to make a search party for Zayde. But you can tell that Chanel just isn't interested at all, and, uh... Basically, she says that Zayde should have gotten kidnapped before betraying her, and I'm just like, Chanel is such a bitch, seriously. And again, the fact they're trying to get us to care for her is really stupid, and there's no way they can get me to care for her when they do this horrible stuff with her. When she does these horrible things, and she's doing these horrible things to people, there's just no way they can get me to connect with her. I'm sorry, there's just, there isn't a way. So... Pete says Grace should tell them about Mandy since they are the last people to see her alive, and she says she found something really interesting. She needs to tell them it's about the whaling in the house on Shady Street, and she says the earliest report, I mean on Shady Lane, and she says the earliest reports of whaling from the house were 1995, before there's nothing. But just three weeks earlier, there were two reported deaths, one from a convenience store of a woman in black who came in and stole diapers, and another from a milkman who says that a woman in black stole a crate of milk from the black back of his truck, and I thought it was funny that Pete's like, who has a milkman? 
Superman in the 90s. I thought that was definitely funny. But he says, she says that a woman in black robes stole a crate of milk from the back of his truck, but he couldn't get a good look at her. She says it's all from the bathtub incident, and suddenly the hack of Shady Lane is stealing milk and diapers, and she thinks she had the Kappa baby, and that the, this woman in black kidnapped the Kappa baby, and she thinks someone might have given it to her, but if they are ever going to find out what happened to that baby, they have to figure out who that woman was inside the house. And basically, we then see that the woman in black is still in that house, and apparently that woman is none other than Gigi. What? I don't understand how this makes any sense. I don't like this twist at all, and if there was anything they could have done with Gigi, they kind of just ruined her character. Gigi was a character that I was really enjoying, and now I really don't like her because it makes no sense whatsoever. And I get, yeah, the innocents are always not innocent, I understand that, but this just felt really bizarre to me. I mean, they had nothing to do with Gigi the whole episode. The entire episode, nothing to do with Gigi. Why all of a sudden is Gigi possibly the one that's doing this? It doesn't make a lot of sense to me whatsoever. And I don't understand how that makes Grace think that she's the baby. I mean, I understand why Gigi would be traumatized from the 90s, but if she's so traumatized, why is she still the woman in black? That doesn't make much sense to me. I don't really understand uh, that at all. Honestly, I don't. Um, I will say, though, that I do feel the woman in black is working with the Red Devil for sure. I definitely think it's possible. That they're definitely working together. Something's going on there. Obviously, Boone is working with them as well. We haven't seen Boone in ages, um, but this episode for me was a very much a mixed bag. There were some things I really loved. Like, I liked, um, the, you know, the Zayde um, plot. I think that definitely is very interesting. I just don't like this episode trying to get serious. It had all these deep meshes that they shoved down our throats, and I don't give two shits about them because these characters are simply not very likable. Chanel is not likable character. She's just a horrible human being in general. Um, all the Chanel's in general, they really aren't that good of characters. Hester, yeah, I understand. She's evil, but I love that about her. I think she's really great. They don't ever give her something too serious, and they did a very good job with that, and I definitely really like her as a character. Um, but even her, I think, even Chad, they, like, used as something serious in this episode, and I definitely do not like that. This show needs to be what it is last week. Just a fun show that they don't take seriously at all, and then I'm gonna love it. I really love what's going on with Hester and Chad. Do you think they're gonna start a relationship? What is, how is Chanel gonna react to this? Obviously, she's probably not gonna find out, but she will eventually find out. We'll have to see what happens with that, because I can't wait to see her reaction. That's gonna be very funny. Um... What's going to happen with Zayde? Will she win this election? Why was she kidnapped? I don't understand why the Red Devil didn't just flat out kill her. Also, my other problem this episode, how the hell is, you know, the Dollar Scholars not somehow affected by the fact that they were almost killed and that they lost one of their own um, when the Red Devil attacked them? There's no mention of that whatsoever in this episode except by Grace. There's no mention of that whatsoever. It felt very weird, and it seems like this show does not care about continuity at all. This is something that Glee did, and it's something that Ryan Murphy always seems to do. My other complaint with the show is that I feel like the reason the show is not working as well as it is because Ryan Murphy didn't focus on the show a lot. If you guys know, when he has two shows, he focuses on one more than the other. American Horror Story Hotel seems like a much more focused show, and this show really doesn't. And American Horror Story Hotel does premiere tonight, and I really feel like that's a lot more focused and that he put a lot more effort into that than he did with this. And I don't really, I'm really not a fan of the fact that he did that, and I don't like that at all, really. I think that's really dumb that he decided to do that, but he did do that for for whatever reason, and yeah, so that's going on there, um, is Gigi really the woman in black, it doesn't make sense to me, I don't understand how she could be the woman in black, and I just don't understand it at all, really, it's, it's kind of stupid, um, we'll have to see where that goes, is Grace really the baby, um, from the 90s, I mean, it does make sense, but it just feels too predictable, I mean, I knew that someone would be going on with Grace, and it just feels too predictable, I wish, I honestly hope the baby at this point is Chanel. I think that'd be an awesome twist if they did that. That'd be really cool, and I definitely really like that. But please, no more chanel Halloween. It's stupid, it's not very funny, and I'm definitely not a fan of it. Overall, guys, this is probably the weakest episode of the show since the pilot for me. The show is increasingly getting better, and this episode was definitely more of a step down than it should have been. I, um, If you guys are wondering, my review for Finding Carter will be up tomorrow because I want to review two horror films for 31 Days of Horror today. I want to get those out so I can you know, get back on track to where I should should be, um, and I will do that today, so I will be reviewing two of those today, and I will see you guys in my next video, which will be for, um, a movie review, uh, 31 Days of Horror, day six, and then I'll do day seven as well today, and I will see you guys for that. Okay, bye.